Hello, and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Tech Exec Podcast, where we triple your impact per engineer. As always, I'm your host, Aviv Ben Yosef, and this episode is all about using tech debt as an offensive weapon. What does that mean? I'll get to that in a second. But before I get to that, this is the last call, folks. If you want to join my one-of-a-kind workshop, where we'll be working together for three hours on setting yourselves to succeed in 2022, learning how you should be measuring your team, your engineering managers, and you yourself in your role as an executive in your company, then this is the place to be. And this is your way to kick off 2022 in a great start. Once you sign up, you also get access to me for 30 days to fine-tune and adjust your plans and your measurements as you start the year. So you're not just left off with whatever you actually wrote down during the workshop, but you have me to help you out as the rubber meets the road. So do check it out. You have like one week if you're listening when this episode comes out. I'm not sure I'll have another one at the beginning of the year. So you might have to wait an entire year. And you know, why waste a good year? Let's make 2022 ridiculously successful together. I think we all deserve that after 2020, 2021. And I think that you owe it to your team and to yourself. So I'm waiting to see you there. If you have any questions or comments, my email, as always, is in the show notes. So let's get started. Now, tech debt is something that, for engineers, seem to be such a sensitive matter. You can't even mention that without getting people charged up. And, you know, I understand that I, I come from the most technical of backgrounds you can imagine, and For years, I used to be like this devout believer in clean code. You cannot have a single line of debt. You cannot write anything that's not perfect. I was like, you know, I used to go and arrange the software craftsmanship meetups here in Israel. I was very active in the software craftsmanship community globally. And I believe that I had a major part in helping many, many people realize that they need to be writing better code. Nevertheless, with time, maybe as I matured, I realized that, you know, things are not as simple as that. They are not as straightforward. It's not just black and white. You have to realize that there are reasons for things to happen. And yeah, I can try and claim that everything has to be perfect, but uh, I'm sorry, it just isn't the way it's going to work. So why even go into that battle with that sort of mindset? Now, what am I talking about? Having worked with dozens of companies, having seen so many successful companies and less successful companies, I always tell my clients that, you know, as much as we'd like to believe it, code, at least its quality, is not something that is a requirement for having a successful enterprise. I have seen countless companies with pretty crappy code, pardon my French, succeed. And yet, I have seen companies that had the best technical teams. Everything was, you know, state-of-the-art, clean. They had all the systems, all the metrics, all the reviews, no bugs. Quality was tremendous. Yet the business went nowhere. Now, I'm not saying that we should be writing bad code for the purpose of writing bad code, nor am I saying that tech debt is something that we need to be piling on without giving it thought. But I am saying that you as a technical leader in your organization have the responsibility of understanding how to leverage tech debt responsibly. Now, as an example, I'm guessing you're working in a startup or you've been exposed to how startups work. And startups, as I'm guessing you know, raise venture capital. They rely on bringing on this, it's not really debt, but they bring on external investment in order to allow them to grow faster. So the difference between a venture-backed startup as opposed to a bootstrapped company would be that the startup would raise capital in order to grow faster rather than wait till they amass all of the money needed for the next stage. And therefore they are diluting themselves, which is kind of the equivalent of taking on some debt, in order to allow for faster growth. 
The same, my friends, applies to how you should be thinking about the quality and the cleanliness of your technical solutions. So, I am not saying that we should be amassing tech debt, but I am saying that maybe we need to be more proactive here in thinking about the kinds of solutions that we choose and actually moving to think about it as some sort of tech credit. Now, I don't want you to get confused with tech capital, which is a whole different thing that I talk about in my book and I talk about in several blog posts and past episodes, and I'll do my best to sprinkle some links relevant in the show notes. But tech capital is about creating code that provides the company with value that isn't just features. Tech credit, which I'm talking about right now in this episode, is about the concept of knowing that we have some tech that is not You know, in air quotes, the best code, the perfect solution, because it enables us to work faster, to get to market faster, to test out hypotheses faster. And at certain stages of your company, that matters more than having the right solution. This is a model that I need you to have to possess in order to make your team think of different alternatives help your team realize when they need to be pushing back about quality and time and when they need to be thinking outside of the box. And by having this realization, your team can then, for example, when faced with the need to come up with a new solution, enable a new feature that the company isn't even sure if it's going to be viable and we need it out in the market to test it, at least to some extent, and, you know, maybe... In a month or two, we'll realize whether this has any real demand and we need to build up on it, or this is just a failed experiment and we can shelve it. So when you're faced with such a situation, most engineers I work with and most engineering teams, you know, we care about stuff. No one wants to create stuff that feels as if it's unprofessional. Nevertheless, we need to realize that You can create code that is not the best, most perfect solution and still be professional, provide the company with value and do so responsibly. So, for example, when let's say that the company is thinking about adding some new capabilities that require you to integrate with several new third parties. I don't know. You need to send out push notifications. You want to set up your first sort of metrics and data aggregation for your first data analyst driven features whatever that is you can start with hunkering down coming up with the best solution creating the framework to allow you to do everything imaginable so you have the right thing to build up on for the next five years or you can say hey we don't even know if this is going to be viable we don't even know if we're going to continue doing this in a quarter How about we find a solution that is not perfect, but good for now, something that we can change later, and just get going. So you're getting my drift? We're taking on some tech credit that we probably will have to return later, but we're doing so responsibly. We know what is our credit limit, and we're not going to let it go over. And nevertheless, by having that, we can now allow the business to iterate faster, to learn faster, especially if you're before product market fit. This is the time where you have to enable the company, the product organization to iterate faster, to learn faster, to execute on different experiments so they can allow the entire company to get to product market fit as soon as possible. So think about that. And Sometimes I find that I have to make this connection clear. I have to bridge the gap between the CEO and the CTO so that one of them, the CEO, often wants to iterate faster so they can see whether they even know what the company needs to be doing. And the CTO is too obsessed about the right, you know, again, in air quotes, technical things to do. But technology is not an end. It's a means to an end. No one sets out to have engineers because the company needs to have pretty code. We have engineers because we need the results of that code. So make sure that you have your priorities straight. 
It is expected that we don't allow the code base to devolve into a big ball of mud. You cannot allow the team to write spaghetti code, code that is unmaintainable, etc. However, I'm willing to bet good money that your team, if it really wants to, can most of the times come up with a solution that might not be the ideal one that they thought of initially, but that can provide value faster, is not that bad, and can be corrected pretty rapidly if we later realize that this is something worth investing in for the long term. Try and take that sort of thought into how you're planning the next quarter, into how your team is making its decisions, how it is communicating with other parties in the company, and how you align the team with the concept of bringing value. Now, this, at its core, is kind of exactly how we increase the impact per engineer, how we create engineers, engineering managers, entire engineering organizations that are aligned with what the business needs. It doesn't mean that we allow the code to be a horrible mess, but it does mean that we always keep our eyes on why we're doing stuff to help us realize whether we are at balance Have we found the equilibrium between the amount of investment that we're putting into the code and the value that it is giving the organization? I hope I'm making myself clear. If you have any questions or comments, as always, just reach out. My email is in the show notes, and I'm happy to talk with each and every one of you. Lastly, I'm reminding you again to check out the workshop. And if you haven't yet, do subscribe to my newsletter. It's the best newsletter online for tech executives. I share the three exclusive insights every single week. There's nowhere else where you can get this. And you can also see nice pictures of me, my new gadgets, my family, my trips. If you're interested in hearing about how I turned stuff like my experience at the last business flight to how you should be handling your organization, etc. You can get all that there. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions, comments, reach out and talk to you soon.